Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Oslo Esports Cup. Uh, it's a tournament where eight very strong grandmasters all travel to Norway to do a bunch of in-person group activities together and then proceed to play an online tournament while sitting directly across from one another. It truly is what esports is all about, except chess can be played over the board and something like League of Legends can't because, well, obvious reasons. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is, it is time for round number six. Uh, the players are ready for battle, and uh, today we got to witness some pretty wild stuff. Uh, something that we have never really seen before, uh, and we're going to get uh, into the games. Um, that's the entire introduction. I apologize, it's round number five, not round number six. Um, so, uh, the video is called what it's called, uh, and obviously this little tagline is what it is, because we had a matchup today between Magnus Carlsen and Jordan Van Forest. Obviously, this is a matchup of... Uh, uh, of, of, of two people who know each other quite well because they, they were on the t a team together uh, recently for the World Championship, and this game did not disappoint. Magnus begins with c4, and Jordan plays the most confrontational move, which is the move e5, taking the center, reverse Sicilian style. And so here, recently, theory has been beaten to the death because uh, everybody's trying to put the knights out, some people are trying to put the bishop out, and the English is so flexible that you can basically play any pawn move and it will become another type of English later on down the line. So Magnus plays the move e3. So it's not the most popular move order. It's also kind of like a French defense where I get an extra move. There's a lot of different, you know, nuances here. Knight f6, knight c3, and now black plays d5 right away. Jordan obviously could have just played two knights and we very well could have gotten a unique, uh, I mean, not a unique position, just a mainline position. But Jordan plays the move d5. Uh, immediately. Now, what is the major difference between this position, which is a main line, uh, and obviously could arise if we got knight c6, knight f3, and then d5, what is the difference between the position with four knights and the position with only two knights? It's kind of hard to say, right? It's not very, not very easy to imagine this. Well, the difference is the fact that the knight doesn't block the queen and also doesn't block the pawn. Which is why in this position, Magnus plays the move queen to h5. Queen to h5, it looks mightily disrespectful. Uh, but it actually, it's, 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 really, it's really not that absurd of a move. Uh, it, it creates an immediate threat on a pawn. And when you defend it, uh, I, I now kind of show my other idea, which is playing the move bishop b5. So this is just a very, very unique way of handling this position. Uh, I'm pinning the knight to the king. There's this. If you try to protect, you might accidentally blunder your knight. I mean, not at this level, but, you know, it might happen. Um, and actually, Magnus played this once already uh, in 2020 uh, against Hikaru Nakamura. Uh, they played a match, a very long match, and one of the lines that they played was this. It's a very tricky line, obviously really only good for rapid play. In 90-minute game, black will equalize and probably slap you for playing like this. Uh, but in a 15-minute game, you don't really have the time. You have the time to equalize. You don't really have the time to slap anybody. So, uh, knight b4 is the best move. This is what has been played. Uh, well, I, I don't know if it's the best move. I mean, Stockfish wants to argue that queen d6 holds everything together. Uh, but, but this is by far the most provocative move, uh, which is just sacrificing this pawn with check. That, that is just straight up a pawn loss. The point is that you can't take it, obviously. Um, black plays bishop e6, and now white has to find a sequence of only moves. So there's the threat uh, of knight c2, so white has to play queen e4. Uh, now I'm threatening to kick out your bishop, and now you sort of get really pushed back here. You kind of grab the pawn, you have to run away. Uh, it's like having a getaway driver, you know, when you rob a bank. I wouldn't know anything about that, but, you know, that's what I hear. Um, so, yeah, here two games have been played. Uh, Hikaru here against Magnus played bishop e7 and castles, and I think he went on to lose the game. I, I honestly, uh, I don't know if he lost because of the opening, but I'm sure losing a pawn and not getting a whole lot of compensation back didn't help. Um... But Queen D7 was played in a game between Ivan Yasevich and Tomaszewski in a title Tuesday game in 2021. So the amazing thing about the chess boom over 2020, 2021 is the fact that games started getting databased like never before. We never really cared about title Tuesday or any of these online blitz games. But because that's really the only place that these really good players could get games in, now they're all over the place. So, so there was a game, to, uh, Ivan Yasevich, Tomaszewski, and White went on to win that game. And actually, uh, that game followed this game perfectly. Oh, this game followed that game perfectly. So queen is under attack, knight is under attack. You have to go here or else knight c2. So queen b1, knight d5, knight f3, long castles. And I believe in, in that game, white castled short. In this game, Magnus plays the move b4. So Magnus is just up a pawn. 
Uh, like, he is just straight up up a pawn. And if he had just calmed down for a second and played castle, Stockfish gives plus 1.6. So it's not up a pawn for anything. You're just up a pawn and... <laughs> Very speculative compensation. You, it's, it's, you know how you say you have compensation when you're, uh, when you're down a pawn in chess? Well, white has the compensation and is up a pawn. So Magnus plays b4, and Jordan's like, well, you know what? I might as well go for it with g5. Now, yes, if you're looking at g5 and saying that's just another pawn, not really. Uh, there is a very cool idea here. Uh, the idea is knight c3, uh, dc3, and the absolutely shocking move, bishop to c4. If you get hit with this, that is, that's brutal. Uh, point being that you can't take, well, you can, but then you hang maiden one, but it's a legal move, you know. Uh, and it's just very, very scary. So g5 is a fascinating idea, Magnus castles. Jordan plays g4, because why else would you go g5? And puts his bishop back on g8. Magnus plays bishop b2 here and just simply has a winning position. Uh, he just needs to be a bit careful. He has to be a bit careful because obviously his knight is a little bit offside. And, you know, it's opposite side castling. So you, it's, never, it's never too late to blunder checkmate as we just saw. So bishop g7. And now, for the life of me, I do not understand why the world champion did not play the move b5. Um... Because after a b5, both bishop b5 and knight b5 are appealing. Um, knight b5 uh, kind of gets the bishops off. The, the, the next move is rook c1. I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I do suppose that h6 is a bit terrifying, right? Like h6 is a little bit of a scary move. Uh, but, if, but there's also bishop g7, queen g7, and you can just take this pawn. So uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, um, I, I, I'm an amoeba compared to Magnus, but I would, I would just go b5. Uh, or at least, you know, like prepare it with something like this. Uh, Magnus here opts for knight a4. So he chooses not to do battle with the pawn, maybe saving that for the future, instead trying to transfer the knight to the c5 square. Jordan here, uh, this entire game, like from g5 onward, Jordan's strategy was completely no respect for my opponent. I don't care who I'm playing. Uh, we're just going to get real wild. And he continues that. He plays the move knight f4. Knight f4 is a... Uh, is a is an absurd move. <laughs> like, so, I mean, it just straight up hangs a knight, like, in one move. Um, but what it does is it opens up queen d2. And when you take on d2, you, you attack the bishop, you attack this, and you also threaten to come back, and the knight is still trapped. So you're going to get two pawns and maybe even a knight for your investment, which is not so bad, right? Um, you're going to get 66% return. So, right, this is the amount you gain over the original investment. 67%. Right, so uh, e takes f4. Uh, bishop takes b2. Uh, and now, you know, again, uh, queen b2 looks like a thing. Uh, but if queen b2, then I don't do this anymore. I just go here. And now this is, this is bad. And if you go here trying to defend, well, then your knight is trapped. So Magnus has some problems to deal with here. I mean, this is the, knight f4 is a, is a really, really creative defensive resource. So we have e takes f4. Bishop b2, and Magnus instead uh, jumps into c5 and invites the queen in. Um, so material actually is completely equal here. Uh, and Magnus has a rook here, bishop here, this is hit, this is hit. But Magnus is still winning. Uh, he just has to play the right move. So he has to play bishop takes a6. The point is that if you take here, I take here, and I'm, I'm getting to your king, and it's going to get real nasty. Um, and I, I'm not taking with the bishop because uh, while it looks like getting the material back like this is good, this is uh, very, you know, black actually is able to hold. Knight b7 actually sets up more danger because if you play king b8, then I can take the bishop. I don't have to, I don't have to take your rook. Um, the, uh, the other idea is that if you play b takes a6, then I check you. I force your king to move. I check you. I force your king to move. I check you. I force your king to move. I check. Right, you get it. Right. I'm just gonna keep checking you and taking all your stuff. Um, so bishop takes a6 has to be played. Uh, if you just begin with queen f5, this doesn't work because if you go for the same combination, I don't have to take. So you have to play bishop a6 first. But in this position, Magnus Carlsen, the goat, plays rook a2 and just hangs a rook. Yeah. He just plays rook a2 and hangs the rook. I and you know, he still tries to go for a little bit of counterplay, but he he just he just hangs a full rook. He just the rook is gone and Jordan just takes the rest of the pieces and 
while his king is wide open, he is up three points of material, but according to Stockfish, he's up 16 points of material. Uh, the reason being, of course, that here he can win the game on the spot with knight e2 check and queen d1, which is just brutal. Uh, but instead, he opts for just queen e2. Uh, and uh, that also leads to mate, because, for example, if you try to avoid the queen trade, there is kabam, kaboom, kersplat, and rook d1. So, Gotham noises. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, what to say? Uh, rook a2. And then he, he's just like us. He's just like us. And this actually was the only decisive game of the match. So, uh, Jordan beats Magnus. And, uh, yeah, I mean, good for Jordan. <laughs> it was three rapid draws and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a crazy complicated game. Jordan set himself up to win this game, though. Like, he, he played, you know, he, uh, he played a very aggressive line. And he never, he never bowed out. I mean, he played g5, g4, you know, knight f4, like g's, you know. So congrats to Jordan. A very nice win. Uh, this, this game is from the match between Shakriyarma Midyarov and Anish Giri, obviously, because those are the players on the screen. I wouldn't be showing you a game with fake names. Uh, this was a complicated affair. So, so this is actually their final blitz game. They played a playoff, which means... Uh, the rapid portion was tied. They both traded blows, both beating each other in 30 moves in the rapid portion. But the games weren't, they weren't recap worthy. This game was recap worthy because it had, it had drama, plot, twist, excitement, right? So uh, this also means that the loser of the playoff gets one point. The winner gets two points. Whereas if you win in the rapid, it's 3-0 and all the money. Uh, but here they split the money one third and two thirds. So this game started out as a King's Indian invitation by Black. But then Anish, rather than playing d6 or d5, plays c5. So he did that probably because uh, Mamidyarov did not play in the most aggressive manner. Uh, obviously, Mamidyarov could play knight c3, e4. Then probably he would have played the Grunfeld. Uh, but instead of that, Mamidyarov played this very kind of non-committal approach where the move d5 doesn't make a whole lot of sense now because the knight usually attacks something. And in this case, it does not. It does not attack anything. So... Um, so for that reason, we get c5, and then we get what's called a Benoni structure after this position. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, this is, this is a Benoni pawn structure, where black has c5, d6, uh, white has traded here, and, um, this is, uh, yeah, that, that, that is a thing. So knight a6, black's counterplay will be on the queen side, maybe with b5, maybe with c4, pressure on the e-file. White is also going to try to respond on the queen side, uh, but white is also going to try to take some center space. Um, and uh, yeah, well, there you go. Bishop d3, rook b8, and uh, white takes center space, and black plays the move b5. I mean, this is, th this is like vintage Benoni stuff here. So, Mamidyarov plays bishop f4, attacking the pawn on d6, and Anish disregards it completely, plays the move c4, and then plays the move b4 as well. So this is a perfect Benoni. Uh, everything has gone right. Anish has an amazing position. Uh, and uh, he even uh, goes as far as to play the move b3. Here, Anish can play bishop takes a4, which is an absurd move. Because why on earth would you give that up? And then just rook e4. He, he, he actually could have just straight up won a pawn. Like, I don't exactly know what was missed. Um, because again, it's a lot easier to sit here like takes takes and just simply rook e4. Uh, maybe, maybe there is some queen c2 fork. Um, maybe, maybe this is what he didn't like. Um, but apparently he can just go here. So now this cannot even be taken because of the bishop. In fact, this bishop is just complete garbage now. <laughs> like, where's it gonna go? If it goes out to c6, b3 always becomes more appealing. C3 becomes very appealing. So, yeah, Benoni is a terrifying whirlwind uh, to get trapped in, and uh, Bishop a4 just wins a pawn. But Anish decides to go b3 instead um, and uh, do it this way. So kind of marching his pawn and knight in together. The problem with doing it this way is that Mamidyarov is able to consolidate more or less. Uh, and, but, but again, Benoni counterplay is never done, so here comes a5. And finally, Mamidyarov gets fed up. He's like, all right, what am I doing sitting around getting bullied by Anish? He's literally across the screen from me. I can just reach out and pop him if I want. So here we go, e5. It's everything that I talked about. I mean, white tries to attack in the middle because that's where white has more stuff, okay? Uh, black plays knight f takes d5. Mamidyarov takes on d6, attacking the queen. We have a trade and the queen slides forward. According to the computer, this position is minus three. White's position is on the verge of complete collapse because one, two, three, four, and five pieces, and this pawn. Like, the only thing preventing Mamidyarov from being lost immediately is what, folks? Wh which piece of the white position holds everything together? How good is your board vision? It's the b2 pawn. 
if this pawn moves, there is an avalanche coming. Not to mention the fact that I'm also just going to win material. So my Meteorov has to act now. What does he do? Moves his knight to attack the queen. Moves his knight out of the danger of the knight and the bishop. Anish plays queen c6. And now queen d2. Anish takes the bishop. And right here, he takes on b2 as well. That's it. The pawn has fallen. The game is over. Right? I mean, Mambidyarov is going to move his rook. Anish is going to, I don't know, move something. And then play a4, a3, a2, gg. No. Mambidyarov refuses to go down. He's going to go down swinging. Plays the move knight e5. The point of knight e5 is that if you take my rook, knight c6, bishop c6, you are close to promotion. But you will never get there. I'm going to get there first because I attack the rook. That is so important here. If you play b2, I take your rook. And now I cover promotion and I'm threatening it myself. So you're so close, but so far. And right now, what Anish has to do is keep the bishop here for a quick sec and just offer up a queen trade. If Anish finds the move queen c2, the game is over. Over! Because white really doesn't have much of a choice. Uh, I don't really know what you're going to do here with white. If you move your queen out of the way, well, now I can take your rook. The only reason I couldn't take your rook is because right, queen c2 has to be played because now the pawn gets closer. Anish doesn't see it. Anish decides to go back, and his idea here is that he still got the pawns going, right? So he can play the move b2. The problem is, now what? Not only now what? White is threatening to win. White is threatening queen takes d5 and knight f6 check. So for example, a4, take, take, check, the king moves somewhere, and, you know, knight d5. Or, or, I mean, maybe even knight d7 first. Knight d7, what am I talking about? You can even, you can force the king to move back into a fork. Look how brutal that is. I mean, <coughs> it, it, yeah, and, 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 and giving up the dark squares here costs a niche. And here there is one engine line which would almost hold the game together, which is the move f5. Uh, but if you play this, you just deserve to go to jail. Uh, takes, takes, knight f6, king f7, knight d5, rook b5, knight f6, rook e5, knight d7, rook back to b5, f4, so the knight can go to e5, and we get some sort of absurd endgame where black is desperately holding on. What happens in the game, though, is Anish plays bishop f5 and loses his pawn. And now it's going to be an endgame where white has a passer, and that's exactly what happens. And Mamidyarov just gets closer and closer to the black king and turns this into a queen endgame and just makes a queen. And uh, wins. He just wins the game. His king is very safe. The pawn is promoting. So massive turnaround, and Mamidyarov gets the win uh, over Anish uh, in their match. Uh, very complicated game. I mean, uh, honestly, exactly what you want. Like, like topsy-turvy opportunities for both sides and Anish missing that critical moment where he had to not take the knight. He had to, he had to like, offer the queen trade, threaten the queen trade, in a sense, because his, rook, his bishop was still attacking the rook. Credit to Mamidyarov. He, cre he created chaos, just like Jordan. Um, the matchup between Liam and Duda was a bloody affair. I think they had, like, one or two draws. I think it was decided in a, in a blitz playoff. Um, but, uh, yeah, Liam, uh, Liam, uh, well, I will show you an amazing game while I battle seasonal allergies. Okay, so this is a Grunfeld. So what we just saw in the Mamidyarov match was playing knight f3, e3 to avoid the Grunfeld. Liam is like, I'm not shook. d5, you can't get me scared. Let's play a bishop d2 Grunfeld. So bishop d2 is a popular, uh, it's a, not super popular, but it's a, it's a smart idea. You basically want this. And then you want to combat this bishop with, like, in the future. I'm not saying right now, but this is kind of the general, you know, idea. Is you, you counteract that bishop. You also try to play h4, h5. Um, knight b6. Uh, uh, Magnus played the move c5 here in the World Cup against uh, Sasha Martinovic uh, from Croatia. Uh, and got a very nice position, actually. I think went on to win the game. Um, in this game, knight b6 is played, and then here you can play this e3, bishop g7, f4 setup uh, with white, which looks kind of stupid, but the point is that obviously you're just trying to prevent black from attacking in the middle, so black tries to attack with c5 and win the pawn back right away. Uh, Liam's like, nope. I mean, you lost that pawn. I, you can't have it. So you can have this one, but this is just going to get me more active. So you can win the pawn, but it's helping me activate my bishop, I mean my rook, and now you've got to make a retreating move. And so what do you, like, you ask yourself, what does black want here? Black obviously wants the castle, take a deep breath. Nope, no breaks. Demetrius Johnson in the octagon. No breaks. Mm-mm, let's go. 
H4, H5, that's the idea. Knight F6, I'm gonna remove that knight from existence, H5. Now, you could castle, that's, that's fine. I have a choice. I can take, I can push. Pushing is a bit committal and sort of stops white's entire initiative because now black just goes here and I don't know how you're ever breaking into that position. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you can also, of course, take. That actually does look very reasonable, but again, you still kind of slow down your initiative. Sometimes in, ch in chess, it's just good to leave the pawn there. Just as a permanent reminder to the opponent that if they mess around, it's going to be bad news. So we have rook e8, bishop c4, knight c6, and now a gangster move. King f2, not castling, just kind of, you know, moving the king to safety. Uh, and the rook is kind of powerful on the h file. You're not, when you castle, the rook has to go over. The rook doesn't have a choice. All right, so when you play king f2, the king is kind of safe and out of the middle, but the rook is still quite active. Now here, bishop g4 looks very natural, but uh, you can't play that move because you activated white's rook a long time ago when you played bishop takes b2, right? So um, we have queen e7, and Liam plays rook b5, which is an absurd move. The point of rook b5 is that if you play a6, um, what I do now is I'm going to plant my rook right here, and if you take on c5, uh, which obviously looks smart, I'm going to go here, and I don't know how you ever remove me from your position. Like, black can't move anything. Because you played a6, you just allow my rook a permanent camping spot. So rook b5 is a fascinating idea, and obviously Duda, Duda's not the kind of guy to see that your plan is to take advantage of a move and then play that move anyway to call your bluff. He's just like, all right, I mean, I'm not going to play a6. So we have takes. Finally, we have takes. And now knight d4. But how is Liam going to get in? Because he, he can't really. Like, no square near Blank's position is just free for transfer, right? So he gets his rook booted, rook c8, bishop b4. Look at this amazing coordination. He plays rook b3 to defend his pawn from the queen. And then bishop b4. But now his idea was, of course, this, which wins. Uh, but now it gets blocked. So he just stays patient for a move. Bishop back to a3 and queen b1. Queen b1 sets up stuff here, but also sets up this, which is pinned, right? Duda plays knight d4, and now dynamite strikes. Wait, we just said knight d4 was designed... Sorry, knight c6 was designed to stop c6. So when you take my knight, I don't have to take back. I just go kabam. Now your queen is hanging. Oh, you take my rook? Well, let me get that queen real quick. And... This, uh, this is obviously, you know, two things are hanging. What do you take? Do you take the bishop or do you take the knight? More often than not, you should take the bishop. The knight is a bit clumsy. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take it a couple of turns to stumble back to a comfortable position. And not to mention the fact that you kind of cut the coordination here of the pieces. So knight d2 and now an amazing move from Liam who is forked, but he prefers spoons. Queen takes g6. If you take this, which looks obviously very, very free, then I play check, king f8, and I sack my queen. And then what happens is, at the end of all this, my rook is going to free the way for my pawn, and there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do. Your knight has to cover promotion, and it can't. So I threaten check, and then queen. So, amazing combination uh, from Liam, who proceeds to just bring his queen back. Uh, and just, when, when you have a queen versus a couple of pieces, what you have to do is you have to simplify down so the queen can take advantage of what's remaining. And um, that's exactly what he does. I mean, he forces a trade of rooks, and, and uh, Duda just resigns because his, his position is just not equipped to battle the pieces. Now, can we just very quickly address the move bishop g7? And I know that the bishop moved again. I know it moved right here. The bishop literally did not take part in this game. Look at the bishop. Liam just played a whole game and rendered an entire piece completely useless. It never moved. It literally never moved. I'm not even going to credit bishop b2 and back to g7. It, it never moved. It just never took part in the game. Crazy. Great game by Liam. Now, obviously, they traded blows, but I thought this was just a really nice game. Uh, Liam wins, and he, he maintains... Uh, Close position to the top, along with Duda, actually. Uh, and the last game that I have for you uh, for today is this game between uh, Pragnananda, Ramesh Babu, and Eric Hansen. So Prague won three games, uh, three matches, 
proceeded to lose to Magnus, and now, uh, although he is still actually uh, very close to being the favorite to win the entire event, just how well he's playing, and also not to mention that Magnus lost to Jordan, so that, that's a big setback. So, uh, Prague plays, uh, we have another Grunfeld. This time we don't have Bishop d2, we have a main line, which is just this, but now we have a sideline. So the main line here is Knight f3 or Bishop c4 with Knight e2, but Prague plays Queen a4 check. Queen a4 is just this uh, one of these absurd engine moves, uh, where you try to throw off the black coordination. Uh, knight c6 looks impossible, but actually very much is possible, but it's not a good move. Um, so c6 is a main line. And you basically are like, haha, now you can't put your knight on that square, stupid. And you also can't play c5. So we play normal moves. Now black tries to take advantage of having been allowed to play the move uh, c6. Queen goes back to a3. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, Prague just has a very active position. If you just look at White's position, all his pieces are very active and nicely placed. Does he have a big advantage? No, absolutely not. Because he played a sideline of the Grunfeld. So does he have a playable and interesting position? Yes. So let's see if we can play some good chess. Queen d6. Prague here says, no, I don't want a queen trade. I want to play queen back to c1 with two ideas. Uh, bishop h6, maybe to trade off your bishop, but also maybe bishop f4, just linking up these two pieces. I don't, I don't need to trade bishops with you. Bishop e6, he kicks out the queen, and now he plays the move knight e5. Now, believe it or not, this attack, the best solution, according to the machine, is to get rid of your bishop completely and take the knight. I don't know what kind of a human plays that, probably a garbage human that doesn't respect their dark squared bishop. Point is that this is just kind of clumsy for white. Like, you're not going to hang your queen, you're going to move the queen, and there's no attack. As nice as this looks, there is zero attack. Um, and if you take with the bishop, then apparently, uh, black just goes here. And if you try to mate black, black just goes here. And I don't know, just apparently, I'm, just, I'm, I'm saying apparently, this is what the engine says. No attack. Where is the attack? H4, queen d7, h5. Where's the attack? There's no attack. Now the queen's in jail. Good job, stupid. So I... Yeah, I mean, apparently, after knight e5, you just take it. Hansen didn't do that because it looks ridiculous to give up your bishop. Uh, and he instead decides to kick it out with his pawn and goes back to f7 to maybe play the move e5 or g5, bishop g6, etc. But now Prague shuts down the opportunity to activate the dark squared bishop with the move e5, plays rook e1, and Hansen is still trying to create counterplay on the queen side. It's a very Grunfeld position, very messy. The computer is sitting here going, oh, white is a little bit better because more space, blah, blah, blah. Um, but position always hangs on a knife's edge here. So queen e6 attacking the pawn on a2, which Prague obviously defends, and now Eric plays g5. So there's two ideas behind the move g5. Number one is to activate this bishop. Number two is to play f5. So if white is not careful here, maybe you're going to play f5, f4, like something like, you know, f5, f4, and, uh, you know, shut, shut down this bishop. But then white will play f4 himself. So g5. Bishop back to f1, which sets up some nasty stuff on this on this queen here. So queen slides out of the way, and now h4. He basically begins taking advantage of the fact that black has pushed his kingside pawns. We have h6, chop, chop, and queen back to c1. Um, queen c1 is an amazing move, which I can't explain at all. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what the idea of this move is. Maybe it's to, again, play f4 and just have the queen join. Uh, so Stockfish wants knight c1, which I understand even less. Although I guess it's to play bishop here and... I don't know. But the point is that the center blob here is doing very good things for Prague. It's, it's really cutting Black's opportunity to coordinate his pieces. So queen c1, uh, and now we see this f4 idea. Hansen tries to defend with bishop h6, but the problem is that after takes takes, there is a move here that is the killer for white. And it, it doesn't look like it does a whole lot. But this is, the, you know, th this is the, the level difference, uh, at, you know, at the top. Um... So the move here is e6. e6 completely cuts the circulation of the black position. There is no communication now among the pieces. Uh, why? The e5 square is a massive transport square. These bishops are just not participating. I mean, this bishop, second Grunfeld game in a row, we've seen the dark squared bishop get rendered totally useless. Um, and yeah, I mean, the game is actually just over after e6. How? Because first this, and then this. And once the knight gets into f7, the, the next piece is coming to e5, whether it's a rook or a bishop, this rook will move and the queen will get active. So when Prague played queen c1, he actually had the foresight to understand that once his position activates, the queen is going to be a killer. And that's exactly what happens. He ends up playing, uh, well, 
Hansen sacrifices, but now there's even C4 to kick the queen out of the middle again. And uh, Eric decides to sacrifice the queen to try to stop the initiative. But um, yeah, I mean, queen C6, everything is hanging. Uh, if you take on D2, you can. I'm going to take your rook with check. So he tries to throw in a check and it just doesn't change anything. And uh, There is one trap here. Rook takes F2. You have to not take the rook with check because then rook back and it's check and you lose your queen. But that doesn't even happen because Hansen understands that, you know, he would play here with check or maybe even take on F2 and it, it's just game over. So Prague wins uh, an awesome game. And Prague wins another match in three games. Every match that Prague has won has, uh, has gone three games. Like, he gets out of there, ver or, or three or four games, I think. He gets out of there so fast, Prague is not interested in long battles. Like, wait, actually... No, every single time that Prague has won a match, it's been, three, it's been in three rapid games, which is crazy. Even when he loses... Prague has not played a single match longer than three rapid games. That's crazy. So the match that he lost against Magnus, he lost 3-0. But every other match, he's won two and a half half. That's unbelievable. So yeah, Prague is crushing. Um, he's currently in first place. He's currently the favorite to win it, which is wild. Uh, and he's collected a good amount of prize money for himself. So uh, yeah, I'll see you all for round number six. Magnus is human just like us. He hangs rooks just like you and me. So uh, we can all feel good about ourselves today. I'll see you in the next recap. Bye. Get out of here.